Welcome to Electron Online, and here we're going to talk about the different kinds of atomic radii that we could run into. All right, first of all, let's start with the metallic radii. A lot of, a lot of elements on the left side of the periodic table, if you imagine the periodic table, to the left side of the periodic table, that's where you have all the metals. Well, they can, they can be in a metallic state, and if they're in a metallic state, the electrons are locked in, in in certain positions, and based upon the density of the atoms and the the number of atoms that would be in a certain volume, we can actually calculate the volume per atom and from that uh, figure out the radius per atom. And so typically for the, me for the metals, we can find what we call the metallic radius. And in the case of sodium, that would be 186 picometers. Now, of course, sodium will bond a lot with other metals, and so they will, they, they will form covalent bonds, and also they will, f they will form bonds with nonmetals as well. And so in those cases, we have what we call covalent radius. So in other words, when atoms bond together in, in uh, covalent bonds or ionic bonds, uh, you'll find that the radius becomes different. So first we'll start with covalent bonds, is where the electrons are shared, and if electrons are shared, it turns out that the radius of these atoms becomes somewhat less than you would find when we have metallic bonds or metallic radii. And so in this case for sodium, when uh, sodiums come together and form covalent radii, the radius of the sodium atom is only 157 picometers rather than 186 picometers. So the nuclei actually come closer together than they, than they would be if they're in a metallic state. Then of course, sometimes uh, atoms make bonds by sharing electrons uh, or actually not sharing so much, but by donating an electron. For example, when sodium and chlorine come together, chlorine has affinity to pull electrons away from atoms. Sodium, the last electron, which is in the, in the S orbital, there's only one in there, they almost freely give the electron away. It doesn't take a lot of energy to pull an electron away from sodium. So sodium becomes positively charged. Chlorine becomes negatively charged by pulling that extra electron in. And then they join together to the Coulomb forces. It turns out that ions tend to be typically much smaller for metals uh, Ions become bigger for nonmetals because nonmetals tend to gain more electrons and metals tend to donate electrons. So because of that, you can see that the, the radius of a, of a sodium ion with just one electron removed is significantly smaller, only 99 picometers as compared to 157 picometers for the covalent radius and 186 picometers for the metallic radius. So in essence, the radius of a sodium ion with just one electron removed is, is almost half the size of what it, would be the, what it would be in a metallic radius environment. Now, there's other ways of looking at the radius of atoms. For example, um, noble gases. Now, noble gases don't react very, very easily with anything else, so they tend to remain as gases, single molecules floating through space. And because of that, it's really difficult to measure the volume of a, of a molecule, like for example, of, uh, or an atom of, of helium. Now, what we can do is we can cool the helium down to the point where it becomes liquid, and maybe even further, where it actually becomes frozen into a solid state. So when we cool helium down sufficiently, it then becomes into a frozen state, and we can then measure the dimensions of it, and measure the weight of that object, and then from that we can figure out the size of the atoms. Pretty well the way we do it for metallic radius. But we can only do that by making it really, really cold, so we call that the frozen state of the gas, to the point where it can actually measure the diameter. Turns out, the distance from nucleus to nucleus of helium in a frozen state is 140 picometers, for example. And finally, in some cases, we can simply calculate what we expect the radius to be based upon the properties and the quantum mechanics states of the electrons in orbit around the nucleus. In the case of hydrogen, we know that the atomic radius is 53 picometers, but that's where we find the highest probability for the electron to exist, and that would then become the theoretical radius of that particular atom. But as we've seen, the, the, the um, electron can be further away, can be closer. It's kind of like that fuzzy ball theory where it's kind of at that distance, and that's the most probable radius of the atom at 53 picometers. And so we can do that for smaller atoms. We will find calculated values for lithium and boron and things like that, where the number of protons and nucleus and number of electrons around in the orbit are relatively small, and we can pretty well figure out roughly what the most probable radius would be of those atoms, and so we can find the calculated radius as well. So, 
In this case, we can see that there's about five different ways of looking at the radius of an atom. We can take a look at it when it's in a metallic state, typically for metals. We can look at it when it makes covalent bonds. We use that for nonmetals. Notice that the covalent bond tends to be smaller than the metallic bond. We can also talk about the ionic radius. It's when atoms actually donate electrons to each other, therefore become ions, and then they bond together due to the Coulomb forces pulling them together because the opposite charges attract. And therefore, you can see that we have what we call the ionic radius, which is for metals typically much smaller, and for nonmetals typically much larger than the atomic radius. Then for things such as noble gases, where it's very difficult to go and measure the individual radii, we can go ahead and cool the, the uh, gas down to the point where it becomes frozen and then measure the relative size of the atoms and therefore find the nucleus to nucleus uh, distance to come up with the radius that way or we can simply use the quantum mechanic effects uh, in where electrons are placed in the orbits around the nucleus based upon the Schrodinger equation, the probability density function and from that we can come up with a theoretical calculated value which can also be used in our calculations. And there you go, not as simple as we thought, but once you understand this, it makes it a lot easier to then go and look at the size and radii of atoms in the future. That's how we do that.